Welcome to Surge Path, Rapid Review for Residents. I've taken over a thousand pages from Rosai, Sternberg, and other texts and condensed them into short whiteboard videos. Today's talk is on salivary gland pathology with a focus on inflammatory lesions. First, a few housekeeping items. This is a summary of the surgical pathology of the salivary glands. It is by no means comprehensive, but it is extensive. And it's based on several sources, and primarily Rosai and Ackerman surgical pathology. It's geared toward path residents, like you see here. Medical students may find it too detailed, unfortunately. And surgical pathology fellows may find it too elementary. I've chosen to use VideoScribe over PowerPoint for several reasons. Primarily because VideoScribe is in a constant state of motion, much like a real whiteboard lecture. And in my experience, that makes for more effective learning. Hopefully this will be your experience as well. As for financial disclosures, I have no money. Each topic will be presented in the following fashion. First, an overview, then demographics and clinical. After that, the gross appearance of the lesion. Following that, histology. Then, uh, special stains. After that, molecular studies. And after that, any other important facts that don't fit in in the other categories. Some of the smaller lesions will be truncated. One of the tasks of the student is to distinguish the important from the unimportant facts, and this is not an easy task. To make it a bit easier, I will write on the board the most important facts, and I will just say out loud the topics of academic interest. Let's begin. Salivary gland is divided into normal, inflammatory, and neoplastic. Let's take a minute to revisit normal. Normal architecture consists of ducts and asini throughout the salivary gland system, as you can see here. This holds true for the parotid, the submandibular, and the sublingual gland. The parotid gland is comprised of two lobes, superficial and deep, and is entirely serous. All of the asini in the parotid gland are serous asini. There are also a number of sebaceous glands interspersed throughout the parotid gland. We don't often talk about these, but they do show up in the tissue and they do show up on exams. The submandibular gland is comprised of a mixture of serous and mucinous glands with serous predominating. There are also some sebaceous glands in smaller numbers. The serous glands are the ones with dark blue cytoplasm and open nuclei. The mucinous glands have a lighter blue to pink cytoplasm, are plump, and have eccentric nuclei with condensed chromatin. You also see as in some slides, as you see here, intercalated ducts. The sublingual gland is comprised entirely of mucinous glands. There's a very small number of serous glands, and there are virtually no sebaceous glands. Other facts about the normal histology. The cell of origin for most Salivary gland neoplasms is the myoepithelial cell. Some also come from the reserve cells of the IC ducts. Neoplasms of the salivary gland are consistently PSA positive for unknown reasons. Number three, ectopic rests exist in the oropharynx, the lips, as well as the nasopharynx, really throughout the head and neck. And number four, don't forget the scattered lymphocytes, which can, of course, give rise to lymphomas in these locations. Let's do a sketch as an overview of inflammatory salivary gland. 
Rosai divides these into heterotopia, sialolithiasis, sialadenitis, cysts, Sjogren's and Mikulic, ir irradiation, and other changes. This can be somewhat overwhelming, so I'm going to subtract out the other changes and deal with them at the end, so that we are in fact restricted to six categories, heterotopia, sialolithiasis, sialadenitis, cysts, Sjogren's, and irradiation. We'll begin with heterotopia. Heterotopias are divided into intranodal and extranodal varieties. The intranodal heterotopias occur in babies, usually occur at the hilum of the node, and consists histologically of ducts more than asthma. Extranodal heterotopias occur within the oropharynx and superior to the oropharynx in places as unusual as the cerebellopontine angle and the pituitary gland. The commonest site for heterotopia is the medial right sternocleidomastoid muscle, right at the sternoclavicular joint. And here's a question. What is the commonest neoplasm of salivary gland heterotopia? I'll give you a minute. You can pause the video. You can look things up. Just try to recall, and I'll tell you the answer in a few seconds. The answer is the Warthin's tumor. We'll cover this in more detail in neoplastic salivary gland. But for now, here's a sketching of a Warthin's tumor. Note that it consists of a bilayer of epithelium overlying abundant lymphoid tissue. That epithelium, especially the superficial layer, is columnar, and there's reversal of the nuclear polarity with the nuclei out toward the apical end. That's very characteristic of a Warthin's tumor. We'll discuss it in more detail later. Next is sialolithiasis, or stones in the salivary gland. Sialolithiasis occurs mainly in the submandibular gland and sometimes has a nidus. When it does, that nidus is often bacterial. However, most stones do not have a nidus. Here's what they look like grossly. And importantly, those stones are made of a material that is easily testable, that is, carbonate apatite. Histologically, you'll see dilated ducts, squamous metaplasia, destruction of the asini, and periductal fibrosis. This is often presented in textbooks as a, a one, unto the, a one after the other process. However, in a given section, you'll see all four. Let's look at an example. There are some mildly dilated ducts. We have destruction of asini with infiltrating lymphocytes. In this photo, we don't see squamous metaplasia but we do see periductal fibrosis. Next, we'll cover sialadenitis. This is subdivided into six other topics and will comprise a substantial amount of our time. I encourage everyone to write down all of these topics and rewrite them until these names and entities stick in your mind. First, acute sialadenitis. This is divided into two categories based on the etiology. First, bacterial sialadenitis. This is co more common and is usually Staphylococcus aureus. It can also be due to Streptococcus and some gram-negative rods. The other category is viral acute sialadenitis. And this is due to mumps, EBV, Coxsackie, influenza, parainfluenza, and several other viri. After that, we have chronic sialadenitis. We talked about stones earlier, so now let's talk about the non-obstructive variety. We'll talk demographics and microscopy. First, these occur; these tend to occur in females, rheumatoid arthritis, and a history of autoimmune disease. Histologically, we'll see a mild lymphocytic infiltrate, parenchymal atrophy, and fibrosis. Now here's a question. In clinically apparent cases, 
What is the commonest cause of chronic sialadenitis? It is sialolithiasis. Now let's talk about the Kuttner tumor, also known as chronic sclerosing sialadenitis. These happen in the submandibular gland, and they feature a plasmacytic infiltrate with thick fibrous bands, but retention of the lobular architecture. And these are thought to be IgG4-mediated diseases. For those of you who know about IgG4-mediated diseases, they're a fascinating topic in their own right and a hot research topic right now. Here's an immunoglobulin telling you about this disease. Let's look at a photomicrograph. Here we have a plasmacytic infiltrate, although in this particular picture many of those are lymphocytes. We have thick fibrous bands, and as these circles highlight, we have retention of the lobular architecture. The thick fibrous bands are important both histologically and grossly. Next is sclerosing polycystic sialadenitis. This one is a little more testable than the other topics. They tend to occur in the parotid. It presents as a discrete mass, and this is a rare lesion. Microscopically, you'll see dilated hyperplastic ducts encased in a hyalinized stroma. It resembles sclerosing adenosis of the breast, if you're familiar with that. You'll see apocrine metaplasia, transluminal bridges, and crib reforming, but most importantly, there will be bright red eosinophilic cytoplasmic granules. Next is granulomatous sialadenitis. These can be caseating or non-caseating, and they are due to the usual suspects. Tuberculosis, as you see here, sarcoidosis, and fungi. Note the rough and buff colonies of tuberculosis, if you can recall back to micro. Granulomatous sialadenitis can also occur from obstruction leading to extravasation of mucin. Histologically, you'll see multiple histiocytes, granulomas, and a mild chronic lymphocytic infiltrate. The inflammatory processes involving the intraparotid nodes can mimic it. Now let's talk about cystic lesions. There are two major families. First, the benign lymphoepithelial cysts. These are multilocular cystic formations lined by squamous or glandular cells. They're surrounded by lymphoid hyperplasia with prominent germinal centers. Often they present as a mass. Here's a photograph. They occur most commonly in the second branchial cleft. Notice the prominent germinal centers and the overlying uh, epithelium with goblet cells. Next are HIV-related cysts. The formula to remember in your mind here is that you'll see the lymphoepithelial lesion or the lymphoepithelial cyst plus myothelial epimyothelial islands. We'll see some photographs of those in a minute. The combination of those two together are strongly suggestive of HIV-related cysts. The islands actually transform into the lymphoepithelial lesion, and so you'll see multiple stages of the same progression in a given slide. Now let's discuss Sjogren's and Mikulic disease. A note about the uh, terminology. Mikulic disease is considered by some to be an outdated term, but others still use it. It's the term for Sjogren's disease when it's restricted to the salivary glands. Let's look at the similarities and differences a little bit further. Mikulic disease is, as I said, restricted to the salivary gland, and the etiology in the absence of Sjogren's disease is unknown, possibly thought to be viral. It could be due to adenovirus. Sjogren's involves other glands as well, is autoimmune, associated with rheumatoid, xerostomia, dacrocystitis, etc. Clinically, there will be a small enlargement of the gland followed by a rapid enlargement of the gland that is often palpable. But what about 
the micro. The micro for Sjogren's disease is a bit more involved than the other topics, so we're going to devote a whole whiteboard to it. First, there will be a prominent lymphocytic infiltrate. And second, there will be epimyoepithelial islands. These are the two hallmarks of Sjogren's. The lymphocytic infiltrate will sometimes be accompanied by hyaline type 4 collagen deposition between the cells. And the lymphocytic infiltrate is comprised predominantly of T cells. The analogy here is that the knights of the realm are attacking the castle, but they're attacking their own castle. thus causing disease. Here are the T cells. Now let's talk about the epimyoepithelial islands. There's a few things to say about these. First, they're seen in less than 50% of Sjogren's. Don't count on them. And they're now thought not to be, myo not to be epithelial in origin. We'll look at what these look like uh, on the slide in a minute. But the big question is, is it lymphoma? That will be your major differential in these cases. So here is the lymphocytic infiltrate of Sjogren's on the left, and here is the epimyoepithelial island on the right. Notice that they can have ducts at times, but they're still comprised of epithelioid appearing cells. Diagnostic criteria for Sjogren's disease, according to Sternberg, are as follows. One, at least four foci, two, at least four, in at least four square millimeters, and a focus of, is defined as more than or equal to 50 lymphocytes. Features suspicious for lymphoma, on the other hand, are B cells outside the islands, especially in anastomotic bands, and the presence of plasma cells, with or without dutcher bodies. Keep both of those categories of criteria in mind. Finally, let's talk about irradiation. In irradiation change, we'll see lining of the ducts with prominent squamous metaplasia. In addition, over a, tw a rapid increase, increase of amylase over a 24-hour period is closely associated with irradiation to the salivary glands. I would hold on to that fact. Now let's talk about the other lesions that are more miscellaneous. These include keratinous cysts, amyloidosis, nodular fasciitis, inflammatory pseudotumor, adenomatous ductal hyperplasia, reactive lymph nodes, and so on and so forth. But most of these look like they do in other areas, so we're going to cover them when we get to those other areas. That's it. That's inflammatory salivary gland in a nutshell, compressed from several sources, including the entire chapter of Rosai and Ackerman's surgical pathology. I hope you learned something and enjoyed it, Comments and questions are welcome, and I look forward to seeing you at the next.